Hello. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us. Peter and I were worried we were going to throw a party nobody would come to. <laughs> that's, often, that's often the case with climate stuff, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about that. Um, so I wanted to just uh, give a really brief intro um, about Peter and why we're doing this. And um, uh, we've been in Griffith Park now nine, many years, 17 years, I think. And uh, during that time, even in that time, the weather has really shifted. We've had nights of extreme heat where it was unhealthy to perform. We've been closed down because of fire. And all of that's in the latter half, right? Before, we, before it was like, wow, this is great. It's so count onable here. So we see that every summer. And we've had to add that to our financial planning. What happens when we have to cancel a performance because there's a fire, that kind of thing. So that, there's a direct impact that's happening now, although I think we're somewhat shielded from it often in this country. So. Uh, uh, Peter and I, we've known each other many years. Our children went to school together. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say he's a personal hero. He is somebody who is so moving to me, what he's done, the work of his life, his book, the way he lives. Um, he's very inspiring. So, oh no, what, Peter? Yeah, and uh, David and Melissa are personal <laughs> heroes of mine too. But no, seriously, I, I'm being completely serious because what they do here is so amazing and it's so community building. And it's so different than the sort of like corporate celebrity entertainment that like is dominant everywhere. And I feel like this is something that we're going to need more and more as we go forward and things get crazier and crazier. So it's, it's incredible. <laughs> um, thank you. Su su it's super fun too, right? What's better than Shakespeare or Beaumont, Beaumont, Beaumont. in the park? <laughs> um, so I asked Peter to join us for the salon and to help us kind of craft some actions that we can take as a theater organization. And thankfully he said yes. So Peter, I'm wondering if you want to just give a few words about who you are and how you came to what your work as a climate activist and climate scientist, and then we'll carry on with our conversation. Sure, okay. So um, yeah, so I'm a NASA climate scientist. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Southern California. I'm speaking on my own behalf here. Um, and I do a lot of climate activism. So I'm a pretty, I'm pretty unusual as a climate scientist because I did come into climate science from astrophysics. So my PhD is in physics. I got it from Columbia in 2008. I was studying gravitational waves. I was looking for gravitational waves from the, the strongest magnets in the whole universe, which are these magnetic neutron stars called magnetars. And I didn't find gravitational waves from them. But um, they're these, they, they have a twisted up magnetic field, which is um, kind of trapped by the iron uh, crust of the neutron star. Neutron star is about the size of Los Angeles, but it's more massive than the entire sun. And like one teaspoonful of material weighs more than Mount Everest. Um, and, and most of them aren't this magnetic, but a few of them, very rare ones, have a twisted up magnetic field which tries to untwist and makes, this is getting really, it's hard to talk about anything science without going into a little bit. But anyway, so the magnetic field, which is left over from the, the kind of initial formation of the neutron star, tries to untwist, but it's kind of trapped by this iron crust. So it makes the crust crack. And this causes a huge burst of gamma rays. And we also thought maybe it could ring the star like a bell and create gravitational waves, which are ripples in space time. And it does that over and over. It repeats sporadically, unpredictably. So we thought maybe if, if we took those, if we look for gravitational waves concurrent with those electromagnetic bursts and we stacked them up, we might be able to dig deeper into the noise and find gravitational waves that, that way. But so in the past few years, of course, gravitational waves were discovered. But before that happened, I left to become a climate scientist at JPL because I got so worried about climate change. I couldn't focus on astrophysics anymore. So I kind of missed out of that astrophysical scientific discovery of a lifetime. But I have no regrets because um, I find what I'm doing to be incredibly meaningful. I, I, can't, can't, I can't really imagine anything more meaningful right now for me to be doing than raising my sons, being a climate scientist and being a climate activist, all three of those things together. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I am a climate activist too because just giving scientific talks 
and writing scientific papers isn't enough. In a, in a rational, sane society, I think it would be enough. But our leaders, the Biden administration, world leaders around the world, are still expanding fossil fuels as quickly as they can, which is that's what's heating up the planet. And so that's basically taking us in precisely the opposite direction of where we need to go. So I wrote a book, I write op-eds, I do a bunch of other stuff, I have websites, I give talks. Um, and none of that was really doing enough either. So a couple of months ago, uh, following right on the heels of the IPCC's Working Group 3 report, which came out on April 4th, I decided to do civil disobedience. And that sort of cracked things open quite a bit. Um, and that was part of a group called Scientist Rebellion. So I, along with three other scientists here in Los Angeles, I chained my wrists to the J.P. Morgan Chase building in downtown Los Angeles. So uh, a lot of the new fossil fuel infrastructure that's being built right now, which is insane to be building right now, the IPCC report said we have to stop that. No new fossil fuel projects, which have a 40 year lifetime. So we already know that to we, things are getting crazy right now, right? With uh, hemispheric heat waves that we just experienced over the last few day, uh, days, the heat dome in 2020, which uh, you know started wildfires. Um, sorry, 2021. The the heat wave we had right here in Los Angeles, which was 115 degrees plus, at my house, killed a couple of trees on my house, which was very sad, and then caused wildfires to start. The bobcat fire started. I don't know if you guys were here for that, but. It was brutal for me in Altadena. I was in a cloud of smoke for six weeks. Um, and that's just here in the global north. I mean, the global south has it even worse. And uh, one of the projects I do at JPL is looking at projections of extreme humid heat, so wet bulb temperatures in the near future at extremely high resolution. So we do something called statistical downscaling, where we take the global climate models and we basically overlay the spatial pattern from satellite observations, and then we can get very high resolution projections of how hot it's gonna get all around the world in different cities going out to 2100. So that's still a work in progress. We just started that a couple of months ago. So that's some of what I do. That's some of why I do what I do. And back to you, Melissa. Okay. Uh, we kind of, I was thinking, that's, a, I think, a good um, segue in the sense that I think one of the questions we all have is where are we in terms of climate change? So you wrote this book seven or eight years ago. Is it worse now than you thought it would be in seven or eight years? Yeah, unfortunately it is worse than I thought it would be now. Um, it's going faster than I expected. And um, that's a lot of that's kind of my subjective sense. I didn't, I didn't think that I'd feel like this and feel like we were this close to losing everything, essentially. <laughs> Sorry for that, for being kind of a downer. But yeah, I didn't expect to be here until I don't know, 2040 or something, just subjectively. Mm -hmm. um, that's not that's not scientific assessment. That's just kind of my my feeling. Like uh, my whole life feels like it's been kind of reassessing year by year where we are in climate change. In elementary school was my first exposure, and um, they called it the greenhouse effect back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was like basically in the 80s, and. Uh, as a, as a young child, I felt like, first of all, this is science fiction. It's probably something I'll never have to worry about in my lifetime, but it's interesting to know about and we should probably do something about it. And second, if it was a problem, the adults would be doing something about it and we wouldn't be here. And that, that was when I was like, you know, I don't know, maybe a 10 year old or a 12 year old. Um, and then I kind of like didn't think about it until I was in grad school in like 2006 basically and An Inconvenient Truth came out I heard from James Hansen and uh, I started getting very very worried that still no one was doing anything about it. Um, I was reading scientific papers about Earth's energy and balance and what that means in terms of the impacts that we're starting to feel now and in 2006 I saw it all coming like a train and still felt surely uh, you know all we have to do is talk about the facts, write some more papers, and world leaders will do the right thing. And now it's 2022, everything's burning, it's way, way too hot a lot of the time. I'm freaking out, I'm really concerned about my kids' future, and world leaders are still going in the opposite direction. So um, so that's kind of the, the political situation. It's going much, much slower than I thought. 
but yeah, the heat dome, I didn't predict that in, in Vancouver and in Seattle, like something that intense uh, was, was it really took me by surprise. And the way we've like transitioned into mega fires and we're transitioning into aridification here in the West and including in Los Angeles, that's going faster than I thought it would. Um, uh, pe you know, people dying in basements in New York because of flooding. I didn't expect that to go so fast. Um, so, you, you know, yeah, I, I, uh, it is going faster than I thought. And I think that there's still a lot of work scientifically to connecting the broad um, sort of trends of global heating. So, for example, we're at about 1.3 uh, degrees Celsius hotter right now on average over the whole surface of the earth than we would be if we hadn't been burning fossil fuels over the last 200 years. Um, so 1.3 degrees Celsius, what does that mean? Doesn't sound like that much. It's you know a little more than two degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, we're, that's increasing at about a tenth of a degree Celsius every five years. So we're on track to hit 1.5 degrees uh, in the early 2030s. And what, is, what does that mean though? Like what does 1.5 degrees mean? We still don't really know. And you know, I, I still don't think we have a clear, a clear enough sense of what that means for food systems, what that means for our society, what that means for civilization, what that means for geopolitics, right? Like what are the political ramifications of 1.3 and 1.5? How many people will be trying to get out of the tropics? And what does that mean for, you know, the rise of sort of fascism if um, there's a sense of resource scarcity and a sense of you know brown people coming from the global south into these you know like are we just is that part of why build a wall was such a big deal uh in the 20 in the in the you know in the trump era right is is that playing into it already i don't know so so i don't know if that answers your question mm -hmm. but um so. yeah back to you yeah um, so to that point of 1.3, 1.5, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot. Can Apparently. You, do you have a, in your book you have a metaphor sort of of the blanket. Can, do you want to just, can you give us a very, the, you know, the five minute, five, I don't know, the quickest, what is global warming? Because we say it a lot, but do we all really know, what, are we talking about the same thing? Yeah, sure. So it turns out that the atmosphere keeps heat in the planet, just like a blanket. So this. This clear sky, um, the air that's uh, that we can see through with our eyes in visible wavelengths, is um, we we would die without it from cold. Uh, the the planet would be a basically a ball of ice without the atmosphere. And so what happens is outgoing. So any any object, a microphone, a stick, a tree, a stove, a burning log, um, a chair, and you know your body, um, basically emits what's called black body radiation, which um, you know, at, at temperatures on the surface of the Earth, that's basically in the infrared. Uh, same, same as with your body. And it turns out that the atmosphere is very much not uh, transparent in the infrared uh, wavelengths. All right. So the plant, so you have sunlight coming in. It goes right through the atmosphere, gets absorbed by the ground, gets absorbed by the atmosphere, and then it heats up the planet. And the planet because of black body radiation is sending infrared radiation, which is just the same basically as light, but it's a little bit too far past the red end of the spectrum for our eyes to see. Some other, other animals on earth can see in infrared and we have cameras that can see in infrared. But that, that radiation coming off from the earth uh, interacts with water vapor, interacts with carbon dioxide, interacts with methane in the atmosphere and a few other things. And those molecules in our atmosphere absorb that outgoing infrared photon and then they, they go into an excited state and eventually re-radiate it in a random direction. Some of it comes back down. And, um, and then actually it's a very good thing because that's why we have life on Earth. It keeps Earth at the temperatures that are basically perfect for humans and perfect for human civilizations. But when we burn fossil fuels, we take old stored sunlight basically, which, which plants turned into carbon and went kind of like fell in the swamp basically before there were bacteria that could break it down anaerobically, turned into things like coal, fell in the ocean, turned into oil and methane. And we we're burning that ancient carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. And so now the 
light energy can't, the infrared light can't get back out to space as easily as it could before we added that extra CO2 in the atmosphere. So you, we're at about 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Uh, we were at about 280 parts per million before we started burning carbon dioxide. Yeah. So we've, it's a huge change, right? It's more than 50% change, or is it about about 50 percent ish like that level um so it's a really big it's a it's quite a significant change to the composition of our atmosphere and because that radiation can't get out more energy is coming into the planet than goes out which means it has to heat up it has no choice right to come back into energy balance but it's gonna it's coming back into energy balance at a hotter temperature and that's what's driving all of the impacts that we're seeing all of the heat waves and fires and then a hotter atmosphere it turns out um, holds more water vapor that's just chemistry and so that translates into these crazier storms when we do have rain and in places that has a lot of rain like the east coast they get crazier snowstorms crazier rainstorms thank you um one of the things that i uh loved about your book is you talk a little bit, you make this distinction between individual action and collective action. And um, you yourself have gone through quite a journey. Maybe you can share a little bit about the individual actions you've taken. And I take inspiration from that in my life, and I'm sure people would. But let's talk about that, and then let's talk about the need for collective action. Because I think all of us want to know, what are we supposed to do? That, right? Yeah, so, um we, we need policies that rapidly change the systems that are trapping us all into burning lots of fossil fuels. So, for example, this, this will be probably pretty unpopular, but I think we need policies to start ramping down the entire fossil fuel industry. I think we need policies to start ramping down the entire animal ag industrial animal agriculture industry, which is about... So, uh, about 80% of all of the heating, global heating, is from fossil fuels in the fossil fuel industry and most of the rest of the 20 percent is coming from animal industrial animal agriculture um, i think we need policies to start ramping down uh, commercial aviation because and I, that's the hardest thing right we all love to fly um, but uh, we don't have a way to do that at scale without fossil fuel we can fly planes with uh, basically vegetable oil and they call it biodiesel but it's basically just uh, vegetable oil that they do a little bit of uh, chemical transformation to uh, that you could do in your backyard. It's not that complicated, but um, there's not nearly enough vegetable oil to run all of the planes. <laughs> if you look at like the pictures, there's websites that show all the planes in the air at a, uh, in yeah. the air at a given time, and it's a lot. It's a, just a ton of planes, and it's it's the industry is growing exponentially. And my my whole thing is we have to transition into what I call emergency mode as a society, where we start taking this very seriously uh, as, a, as an emergency day. It's our treating it as the emergency that it is. And, uh, and we're not doing that yet. So some of us are starting to realize it's an emergency, but collectively as a society, we haven't gotten to that place yet. You don't, you don't see them, you know, te most TV shows don't have climate change in them. That's starting to change. Most movies don't. Uh, the, the newspaper, just in the last year, the newspapers have started talking about it more and started talking about it with more urgency. Uh, but they still have a ways to go. They haven't been telling the story of how the fossil fuel industry was lying and spreading disinformation and trying to delay action and buying politicians like Joe Manchin and basically all the Republicans for decades and decades to stop climate action. Like that should be, that story should be huge news. Like I don't know why, I don't know how, how that's not, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing, right? Because I think journalists feel like, oh, we can put that on the front page one time and then we've already told that story. But somehow the journalism's broken too, right? The media is broken. So uh, they, they have to tell that story all the time and we have to know what the fossil fuel industry and its executives and its lobbyists have very intentionally, very consciously perpetrated on all of us and on our collective future. So, um, so yeah, we need policies to change. And the policies are kind of common sense, uh, if you think about it. Like, so if 80% of this problem is caused by burning fossil fuels in the fossil fuel industry, we need a plan to ramp that down year on year very, very quickly. Because the longer we take, the more we're going to lose and the more we're going to risk and the more people are going to die. If 20% um, of it's from 
uh, industrial animal agriculture, the same thing. We have to ramp that down on a schedule. And there's no plan to do either of those two things. And it's really, it's not rocket science, but it does mean that I think the hardest thing that we'll have to kind of give up collectively, at least in the short term, until we have more energy dense batteries and we can fly planes without fossil fuels will be planes. But most of the other stuff, I don't think will be too bad um, to give up, uh, honestly. And to me, there's, there's a lot of joy in kind of being more local and this kind of community, right? And doing this kind of, like having this kind of entertainment instead of just streaming stuff. Um, but we, we need to, if the politicians are captured by fossil fuel money, as uh, you can clearly Google for yourself that they are, right? There's uh, websites that show exactly how much uh, this or that politician takes from the fossil fuel industry. Um, and it's a depressingly small amount, actually, <laughs> that to buy out a politician uh, for the, for given the stakes, right? Given that the, everything is at stake, you know, it's kind of depressing how cheap it is to buy Joe Manchin. But, um, but that's what's happening, and so we, even if we, had, if we had a democracy, we would be solving this right now on a wartime basis with great urgency because the people who want climate action far outnumber the climate deniers and the people that want to stop climate action. Um, but we don't have a democracy. We have basically a captured kleptocracy. And so we, we, we need to build a grassroots movement that's extremely, extremely strong. And that's why we need all of you guys to be climate activists. So my, my like catchphrase is, that we need a billion climate activists, basically. Um, and then not, not a single one of us has to lift the whole weight of the world on our shoulders. We'll, we'll all be lifting it together, and we'll all be fighting side by side. Now, in terms of individual action, um, in 2010, I didn't kind of know what else to do. So I did kind of get a little bit obsessive about reducing my own reliance on fossil fuels. And I discovered that out of everything I did, the two biggest reductions I could make were flying less and eating less meat. And, but basically becoming a vegetarian. And um, I, I did those things because I just kind of wanted to. And I also hoped, and, and it was sort of joyful and fun, weirdly, and I explain why in my book. Um, for me, at least, I, I enjoyed it because maybe because I was so worried about climate change that to feel like I was experimenting and pushing the boundaries of these systems, these cultural and infrastructural and energy systems and food systems, and kind of like exploring this with my community, um, uh, that was kind of fun and joyful. And I felt like sort of like a kind of pioneer um, and kind of exploring this frontier. And I, I sort of hoped that that would catch on and it would like a lot of people would agree with me and start experimenting in that way. And it really didn't. So so I was like, you know, in the, in, at the time I was like, this is a way we can actually push for systems change. We can shift the culture by doing some of this stuff in our own lives and kind of like being infectious about it. And it just turned out not, I don't think that that's a fast enough path for getting to where we need to go. So if, if it makes you feel better and if you find it fun, definitely explore those ways to reduce your own emissions. But it's much more important to be an activist. And um, at this point, I would say even, even taking risks in civil disobedience and risking arrest, and there's different levels of risk. Like my, my action at JP Morgan Chase Bank resulted in a uh, misdemeanor trespassing charge. Um, and I thought I might get fired from NASA. I, I thought there was a small risk of that and it totally didn't happen. So, so it turned out, you know, I might get some community service. I might have to pay a fine. I'm not even sure yet, but there were not any ramifications with my job. Um, and that's like kind of like, I would consider that the lowest level civil disobedience you could do. And given the fact that I was a NASA climate scientist, it turned out to be incredibly effective. Like, I didn't really have to go to prison for two years to have a huge impact. I mean, maybe at some point in the future, I will have to kind of wrap things up. But for now, there's a lot of avenue, I think, for low risk civil disobedience that can have a huge impact. Uh, do you have any advice to how to connect with those activist communities or that what yeah. Can we, what so, can we do if we want to go and, and do civil disobedience? How do we do that? Here in Los Angeles, there's a really good organization called Extinction Rebellion in Los Angeles. And you can you can get in touch with them by their website. Um, I really like them. I uh, have beers with them sometimes. And um, <laughs> they're kind of like my brothers and sisters in arms. And uh, the sense of solidarity that I have with them is really 
something special and um, that's what that's one of the things that keeps me going and like keeps me from getting all depressed and like just shutting down in despair and anxiety is like being with them and knowing that you know before I, I have to say before I, I did the civil disobedience action myself I was thinking about it for many many years and sort of feeling like kind of not so great that it, that I felt like I didn't have the guts to do it and um, and I would see other people doing civil disobedience and I wanted to like boost them and I wanted to get to know them but I felt like by not doing it myself there was this kind of barrier I couldn't just be like fully fledged and part of that community and then then when I did it it was really cathartic and really really spiritual I'd say like a really spiritual thing I just felt like the right thing for me and like I was solidly on the right side of history and I felt kind of proud but not in an arrogant way sort of in a humble way because I felt sort of like you know I was like protecting the earth and I was being sort of a spokesperson for the earth and I was like giving back to the earth for like the earth created me right and I, I like oh every bite I take every breath I take every drink of water I take uh, every time I'm in nature and feel the awe of that and look at the stars and feel the awe of that that's like I, I wanted to give back to that amazing gift of just being here and so so to me it was I, I don't know, like I would, I would encourage everyone if you can switch. It took me a couple of years to work up to it. And it took a lot of conversations with my partner who in, in the beginning was against it. And that, that was a big barrier to me, right? For her to not want me to do it. And then about a month before I did it, I'm like, I have to do this. Like, I just can't, this is like Scientist Rebellion is planning this. I can't sit this out. I have to be a part of it. We cut, we came up with this action, which I think it's good. It feels like the right action for me, like pretty low risk. And I looked her in the eye and when she realized I was really going to do it, she changed and she was like totally supportive from that point. And it was, um, that was a wonderful feeling too, to have my kids and my partner uh, really start to shift and support my activism in a deeper way. So, so that was kind of my journey. And I think everyone, to take these kinds of risks, it um, takes a bit of soul searching and a bit of that sort of interpersonal work but it's worth it i think if you can do it and i think i mean that is very inspiring and how where i am is sort of i'm now somebody who talks about this a lot with people and and i just through peter's coaching have you know i've, I've really just started starting to say we need to end fossil fuel like that's the message there's no there's no way around that message and that's the easiest message to it's so clear so I just encourage all of you to talk about it. And I'm like, I'm on a face, several Facebook moms groups and no one ever writes about it. Like that's not what's being posted about. And that's literally the most important thing that we're facing. And I'm, they're very progressive groups. You know, it's not, we talk about politics. We talk about things like that, but that's not what's being posted. And I think people are, it's a big, scary thought. So I think just first step, we should all be talking about it. Agreed. Yeah. And then we have, yeah, I wanted and, to say that we have like just a couple more. Yeah. And I, I want to say too that something, so I, I'm often asked at the end of interviews, what gives me hope? And one of the main things is maybe a little, like I'm not being sarcastic, but we have, I think as a society, there's 8 billion humans on this planet and we've barely tried to stop earth breakdown and global heating, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, so it's not surprising that we haven't had a lot of success because I think we barely tried. And if we all start pitching in and joining up together and sort of fighting a little bit and um, making some noise and talking about stuff and trying some things and experimenting, maybe doing some civil disobedience and who knows what five years will bring for the movement, right? Because it's changing very rapidly. Right now, I think we're at the moment of like fairly low risk civil disobedience is a good way to wake people up, bring more people into the movement. Um, once we start to wake up, and I think that could happen surprisingly fast, I think humans, we, we're extremely smart as individuals, but I think as a species, we're, we're not a lot different than like fish, when you see the, the fish change directions all at once, or when you see a flock of birds change direction all at once, I think we're quite similar to that. And once enough of us are talking about it and making noise, maybe risking arrest, maybe writing op-eds and maybe 
writing music about it, having discussions like this. So this, I mean, this is a great example of what we need to do, right? So Melissa and David, they, they run ISCLA, They're, they do Shakespeare in the Park, and here we are talking about climate change, right? So whatever it is that you do, you could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then I think we reach a social tipping point and things could change faster than we ever dreamt of. And we could have this incredible feeling of solidarity. And like maybe we're finally going in the right direction, which to me would be such a great feeling. Like that's honestly, that's the one thing on my bucket list is I want to feel like as a species, we're going in the right direction instead of the wrong direction. We're going towards a cooler planet instead of a hotter planet. We're going towards more biodiversity instead of the sixth mass extinction. We're going towards more love instead of more hate. And to feel that and the solidar the cosmic solidarity, like that we are becoming mature as a species, uh, that's what I want to feel before I die. Thank you. I think that is a, a great way to leave our conversation for now. Um, that's beautiful. Um, this is, uh, we're going to have some questions, but just before we do that, um, the, his book is Being the Change. It's Peter Kalmus. It's really wonderfully written. It's a really great book to read. It has a lot of inspiration in it um, and some sobering facts. Yeah, and if, if you don't want to buy it too, it's on my website for free. Um, which is uh, just, I think it's peterkelmos.net. I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> but you can, you can Google it. It's um, maybe a little hard to find because it's just like the chapter, each chapter is an individual HTML page. But um, I talked to my publisher after a couple of years and they were like, yeah, sure, you can do that. And I'm like, cool, I'll do that. Great. Um, we just have maybe just a one or two questions if anyone has questions um, for Peter. Yeah. Okay. Extinction Rebellion. Wait, wait, uh, yeah. So this is yeah, Extinction Rebellion, Los Angeles. Yeah, and it's a global group. They're the people that in the UK block a lot of roads and get like, you know, nasty grams from people for doing that. But I'm like, what's more, what's less, what's more inconvenient? You know, an activist making you wait in your car for an extra 20 minutes, or like, you know, a giant tsunami coming down the street and like, you know, kind of carrying your whole car away or fire burning you up. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. come on. Mm -hmm. These these activists are freaking heroes, in my opinion. So, quick question: uh, What's your thought of fission, fusion or fission energy as opposed to? Okay. Awesome. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, what's uh, what's what are my thoughts on fusion and fission um, as opposed to fossil fuels? So, um, I think that the environmental I'm getting trouble for saying this, but I think that the environmental movement made a big mistake by bashing on nuclear the way it did. Um, mm -hmm. I'll get in big trouble for saying this too, but in my opinion, nuclear waste is overblown as a problem. The biggest problem with civil nuclear energy, there, there's two big problems with it right now. One is weapons proliferation. So there are ways to do reactors that make it very, very hard to create weapons grade material from the reactor, like molten salt reactors. The second problem is it's just expensive now. So um, it's a lot more expensive than building out solar and wind and having battery storage. But it is really solid baseline energy that doesn't contribute very much to climate change. So there's a little bit of contribution from the mining part. In terms of fission, it would be absolutely fantastic if we ever have it. Uh, it's the, you know, physicists, it's a big joke for physicists that it's always 10 years away. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't count it out, but I wouldn't bet on it either. So I think we have to assume that it's never gonna happen. And then if and when it does happen, we can be delighted and power everything with fusion and uh, go merrily on our way as a species. Okay, yep. So that, the question is, is there sort of active, active activism around right now in Los Angeles around creating more public transportation, making our city not car dependent? Yeah, there, there is. I'm, I used to be tied in pretty well to that, uh, to, to, to sort of the complete streets movement in Pasadena. Uh, back when I was kind of writing the book, um, I was really active in a group called Transition Pasadena, which is part of the Transition Town movements. 
and and uh, really wanted to see better and more and safer bike infrastructure in particular, um, bicycle infrastructure. Um, it's you know there's there's a tragic story here in Los Angeles about the eradication of the streetcars. We had one of the best uh, tram systems here in Los Angeles of any city in the world, and um, the auto industry lobbied to to rip it out. Right? They just ripped out a perfectly good, beautiful streetcar system. And uh, there's pictures you can find of streetcars literally stacked on top of each other, I think in the 1950s, and it was just a tragedy. So um, yeah, there's you know, conge I think there's movements for congestion pricing. Um, obviously, it's uh, hugely interdependent with the housing crisis too. So it's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated issue, but I definitely, I dream of urban centers that don't have cars and that are really focused on, there's, there's a lot of studies and a lot of empirical evidence that businesses do better when you get rid of cars, not worse, because it just it, it makes the streets so much more vibrant. But yeah, get I would encourage you to get involved with that. I don't, like with XRLA, I don't have like, unfortunately, the name of like the group you should find. Um. Great. So we're about to we're gonna get ready to start the show. So thank you all so much. Enjoy um, the show. It's really fun. I think that yeah. let's thank Peter. Thank yeah. you, Peter, for being here. Thanks, nice Thanks for listening. And uh, let's all be climate activists. And so now we need uh, let's, this is about twenty people. So you said how many a billion? Now yeah. there's twenty fewer. We, we need, yeah, we only we're... need nine hundred and ninety nine million more. So, nine hundred and ninety nine thousand. Um, but I think that the idea of there being hope and collective action is also absolutely the truth of theater. Theater is a theater is an art form that takes collective ad action, and in theater, the big big lesson is you know of, the, of this play tonight is impossible things can take place. So let's all hold that that is possible and work as hard as we can. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.